from yesterday. I guess today is Mr. Luther. That's your name, right? Luther? Just Lou. <laughs> Lou Palmer. A writer, warrior, and educator. Just to list a few of the things about him. He is also the husband of Miss Georgia Palmer. Welcome, Brother Lou Palmer, to Voices. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Brother Lou. Uh, Brother Lou, where were you born? I was born in Newport News, Virginia. March 28, 1922. And what was it like uh, being raised in Newport News, Virginia? Well, many people call Virginia a border state. Actually, it's a southern state. And I, I know that my life was, was plotted by my childhood in Virginia because this was a community where everything was segregated. You got on the bus, you automatically went to the back. You didn't even think about it. You just went to the back. Uh, movie theaters that were what then was called Negro movie theaters, a couple of them on our side of town. We could go to the white movie theaters if we went around the back and went upstairs and sat in the balcony. Well, my father would not permit us to do that. And it really was my father who, who set the course of my life. He was the principal of the Negro High School in fact, he came from Snow Hill, Alabama. And after he graduated from Wilberforce University in, in Wilberforce, Ohio, he came to Newport News to start the first Negro high school. He started it in what must have been little more than a shack. But over a period of 23 years, he built that high school into one of the best in the country, not one of the best Negro high schools, but one of the best high schools. Huntington High School, which was the name then, was such a quality high school that our graduates could go to almost any university in the country without an admissions test. It was just known as one of the country's best high schools. What happened to my father is really what makes me what, well, the way I am today and have been for many years. Because white people, literally killed my father. Didn't lynch him in the general sense of the term, but he was fired as principal of that school for no real reason. And because he was so tied to that high school, high school was his life. In a year's time or so, he, he was just dead. It broke his heart. And they fired my father, claiming <clears throat> that he was a communist, 
that he was some other names they would give. But mainly, they saw an institution which was so excellent that they did not believe that Negro boys and girls should get that kind of an education. Proof of it was that once they fired him, they brought a brother in from off the railroad, a Pullman porter, made him the principal, and the school immediately began the process of deteriorating. The ex one of the excuses they gave for firing my father, he and three other teachers led a fight for equal salaries for Negro teachers. In those days, our teachers received considerably less money than did white teachers. And my father led that fight, and uh, eventually it got into court, and it prevailed. Well, again, that was too much for that white school board. So when my father was, was fired and died as a result, I just knew that I wouldn't, I was in college then, I just knew I could not be uh, a passive individual. And uh, I began the process of becoming what I am today, and I hope what I am. You, you said I'm a warrior. Well, I sure hope I am, because I am fighting not only for my father, but for all Africans in America who just remain uh, oppressed in this society. Yeah, what college did you attend, brother? I went for my bachelor's degree. I went to Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, then I went to Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York, and got my master's in journalism. And then went to the University of Iowa. And I completed all of my residence requirements for the PhD in mass communications, started writing my, my uh, dissertation, and I got a job at Fisk University as head of the news bureau there, and in moving to Fisk, I lost all of the research that I had done for my dissertation, and uh, I never had the heart to start over again. But I really am glad because if I had gotten a PhD, I'm sure I would have gone on off to some campus and gotten lost instead of being out here on the streets where I've been as a working newsman. So I'm, I'm really, and people think it's sour great, I'm really glad that I did not get that PhD. In other words, if you had gotten a PhD, it could have been something like a co-option, am I? Well, it might. It could have been a co-option, but it also could have been just uh, losing yourself. You know, these campuses, you can get on these campuses and just just get lost. Not necessarily being co-opted, but just getting a part of that process, and you don't get out here in the streets. I either read or heard you say, I think, you know, I don't want to misquote or make it a that during the time that, and, I, and I'm from the South, so I do know something about how some of this mess used to operate, uh, is that the white folks in Virginia, I think you wanted to go to school in Virginia or something, and the white folks were willing to pay your way out of state rather than have yeah. you go there? Well, the, uh, I don't know whether it was law or just policy, but in those days throughout the South, you were, blacks were not admitted to the state university. In my case, it would be the University of Virginia. So they worked out a scheme whereby if black students sought to enroll in the state university, they would simply not 
admit them. But they would say, now, you can choose any university in the country outside of Virginia. We will pay your tuition, books, uh, and two round trip tickets for that year. Well, <laughs> that was that was a heck of a deal, because I really didn't want to go to the University of Virginia. And I chose Syracuse University, and they paid my tuition, and they gave me two round trip tickets a year. And uh, that went on for quite a while. A lot of us were educated through that crazy process. And what year are we talking about now? Well, let me see. I graduated from the Virginia Union in 42. Uh, went into the Army, so it had to be 46 or 47, somewhere in there, that I went to Syracuse and got my, uh, my master's. Now, that's something new. I didn't know you were a military guy. What was your life like during that time? <laughs> that was really a, a trip. I was assigned, mainly because I guess I was a college graduate, I was assigned to what was called special services. So during the uh, war, I sang with a quartet on army bases, even on troop ships going overseas and all of that business. I was uh, also assigned to the camp newspaper, and that's where I learned that I had some writing skills. And uh, I never, I don't even know if I ever shot a gun. I certainly was not in combat and didn't try to get into combat. But uh, I had a soft birth in the Army. <laughs> were you uh, were you a non-com or were you an officer? I think I got as high as corporal, <laughs> so I didn't get very high. <laughs> that I would say that influence had other you know had influence on your life during that period well there was a teacher at Virginia Union his name was Pat McGuinn now he's a brother but that name sounds Irish uh, but Pat McGuinn was a guy he stayed on me that is I think he recognized, you know, some of the skills and, that I had. And typically, you know, I didn't live up to my potential. And he would just stay on me. And he would lay on me. And pretty soon, it became clear to me that I was not going to be able to slough off as long as Pat McGuinn was my teacher. And slowly, I began the process of maturing uh, and I'll never forget uh, uh, Pat McGuinn. Uh, I suppose the other person who had the greatest impact on my life was Enoch Waters. Now, Enoch Waters was the, I guess it was the managing editor of the Chicago Defender. My first job in journalism was at the Chicago Defender, and uh, Enoch was my, my uh, editor. And I always say, wherever I am, that it was Enoch who taught me how to be a black journalist. Uh, I learned a good bit in school, you know, the skills and all of that thing. But actually becoming a journalist, Enoch Waters, who is deceased now, uh, was my mentor. And I don't think I would be anywhere like the kind of journalist I hope I am had it not been for Enoch. Okay, so what you mentioned that. I, uh, I've heard you say on occasion that the uh, defender will not even print anything you say. Can you kind of expound on that just a little bit? Well, the defender is really a, a shame. Under Abbott, who founded the Defender, 
The Defender became a great newspaper. It was a leader uh, with the uh, Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro African, no, Baltimore Afro American. And incidentally, last year, the, uh, the Baltimore Afro American inducted me into the Black Press Hall of Fame, for which I was very honored. But the defender after Abbott just became uh, a shell of its early self. John Singstack became the publisher and for whatever reasons never gave the inspiration to that paper that Abbott did. And uh, I, 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 I quit the Defender three times, and the last time it took. Uh, I had to leave the Defender mainly because the Defender was reducing me to mediocrity. And if I had stayed with the Defender, I don't think I would have been able to develop the kind of, uh, or at least the, 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 the attempt at excellence uh, that I hope I tried to show. Because the Defender, and this was in 1950-51, in, uh, uh, the Defender was just totally mediocre, mediocre, and uh, it has done little since then to increase its stature. Uh, today, the Defender <coughs> uh, bans my name from its pages. <coughs> Excuse me, you'll never see the name Lou Palmer in the Defender. The reason for that is that John Singstack banished me from the pages of the Defender when I sued him for libel. Uh, I sued him for a million and a half dollars because they libeled me. And the uh, case never got anywhere because corporations have a way of stalling and stalling and stalling. This was eight years ago or more. and. Uh, the thing just languishes. I'm sure it's dead by now. But for a newspaper, which is the oldest newspaper, oldest black newspaper in the country, one of only two daily newspapers that I know of, there may be another one now, uh, for it to be as shallow as it is, it is just a crying shame. But uh, I have virtually no confidence in the Chicago Defender. In fact, I call it the Chicago Offender because it offends. Uh, Defender will not take stands on, on our struggle uh, and its quality is extremely low. So uh, I have no respect for Chicago Defender. What, uh, what was the libel suit? Well, <laughs> I had become chairman of the Chicago Committee for Wallace Davis. Wallace Davis, for those who do not know, is the former alderman of the 27th Ward. He's now in prison. But way back then, and this I guess was I can't even recall. Uh, Wallace had been shot in the back by a white policeman. And it had, he was taken to the morgue because they thought he was dead. And when he got to the morgue, a nurse noticed his toe twitching. And she yelled and said, this man is alive. So they brought Wallace back to life. He was extremely uh, wounded. His, his insides were virtually reamed out. But over a year and a half or two years, I was chairman of the Chicago Committee for Wallace Davis, uh, working with young Ralph Metcalf. One of the things we were trying to do was to raise money. 
one of the things we did to raise money was to uh, get Muhammad Ali to fight a benefit fight over at DuPaul University's gym. Make a very long story short, with Ernie Terrell uh, uh, putting on the show because he's very experienced in that. One day the defender came out with a headline that said, FBI eyes Lou Palmer. And the subhead said that I had skimmed $75,000 off of this fight. Well, <laughs> it was just so utterly ridiculous because we did not even come close to raising $75,000. And number two, the money was handled totally by the Illinois State Boxing Association, whatever they call it, I mean, a state agency, because they get uh, taxes off that money, and they, look, they take up the tickets, take the money. I mean, they do, they control the money. So the thing was just so utterly ridiculous. They claimed that I had stolen $75,000 from this fight. Well, I immediately uh, filed a libel suit, and I had my ducks in a row. I could prove without any doubt. But they stalled and stalled and postponed and postponed, and uh, I'm sure there's nothing much that'll ever, nothing, period, that will come out of that. You know, you may own 2400 uh, South Michigan one day. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, money, it uh, seemed to uh, be the, the perception of some people in the public that you are a very wealthy man, you know? <laughs> And I often, you know, I hear you when you respond to them, you know, I mean, uh, what would you say to them? <laughs> well, I've never earned big money. Uh, in fact, I am, I wouldn't be classified as poor, but in a relative sense, uh, I am, I'm at the lower end of the scale. And one of the reasons is that, you know, I have given my life, as did my father, to this movement. And uh, my organizations, for example, uh, BIPO and CBUC, uh, it costs me money to keep those organizations alive, this building in which we're sitting. Uh, my wife and I are buying this building. BIPO and Seabuck have never paid rent, and they haven't been able to pay rent, which is why they haven't paid rent. So over the years, <clears throat> we have paid the mortgage on this building, but never got any rent from it. Uh, a lot of people think that I am paid a salary here at Bippo and Seabuck, and most uh, heads of organizations like PUSH and, and the Urban League, the NAACP, they do get paid, and paid well. But I've never, never received a salary of any kind. In fact, we don't have a salaried person in our organization. We have one young lady who we scrape together and pay her, now we pay her $150 a week. We used to pay her $50 a week. Uh, she couldn't handle that, so we gave $100 a week. Now we scrape together, and sometimes we can't pay her. So, you know, no, I have virtually, I have n no money. I am now on Social Security, and uh, I leaped around in my job so much that what pension money I have is, is just, uh, is almost nil because I never stayed on a single job long enough to build up pension, and this is uh, an aside, but I, I want to say it. Uh, I am now telling young people, be sure you begin the process of planning for your retirement. If you don't, you end up 
with little more than your Social Security check. And let me tell you, that is, it's almost a ripoff. I did not know that the government taxed Social Security. They put an income tax on Social Security. I did not know that Medicare, that you had to pay premiums for Medicare. I thought Medicare was just automatic. My whole point here is that our young people must begin at least by their 30s to begin a plan so that when they hit 65, they've got retirement money and don't have to be worrying each month on how they're going to meet their bills and their living expenses. That's on the side. But every chance I get, because our kids don't think about it, my own kids. I asked my son the other day. Uh, he's in his mid-30s. I said, what are you doing about your retirement? He said, huh? I said, what are you doing insurance-wise? Insurance is a trick, so i got to be careful about insurance. But building some kind of process so that when you're 65, you have sufficient income. Speaking of family, how many children do you have? I have two. Uh, they're both living in St. Louis. My, my son is, I don't know what his title is, but he's a fundraiser for muscular dystrophy. And, you know, uh, Jerry Lewis puts on this uh, some kind of radiothon or television thon or whatever it is every year. He's a part of that process. My, my daughter is winding up her Ph.D., uh, on a, a very good fellowship, which she was able to uh, obtain. Uh, my wife, Georgia, uh, when, when I married her, had four children. Uh, one of them is dead now, Stanford, who was uh, a handicapped boy. He died in his teens. But now she has three, we have three children uh, from from her marriage. Okay, now, you chose uh, African-American people, or African people, period, over uh, big money. And looking back, 1989, do you have any regrets at all about that? No, I have no regrets. I really do not. I could have made big money in my day. Uh, but again, I guess, Money never excited me, and still does not. Uh, people who are close to me uh, scold me uh, for the way I dress. I do not dress well, as they put it. Uh, I, I have never cared that much about clothes. I buy my suits what few I have from a, a resale shop. Uh, I do not spend much money at all on clothes. I don't care. You know, if you're clean, you know, whether you're in style or not, really it doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, automobiles, you know, I drive small automobiles. Now I drive a, a, a minivan because my wife is in the, the floral business and I have to deliver flowers for her. So I put aside the little, I think I had a little Pontiac. So I traded it in for the minivan. Uh, the building which she and I are buying is a magnificent building. Uh, it's one of these old mansions built in 1863. We got it on a very, very good deal. And uh, the problem is it requires huge sums of money to maintain it. So, you know, we live here at 37th and King. People used to say that Lou Palmer lives in uh, Peel Hill and all of that foolishness. We live in the, in the heart of the ghetto, uh, would not move because we enjoy it here. We have some problems living down here, but uh, we live with our people. So all of that to say, that uh, no money as money really doesn't mean that much. You see, I take this, this position. 
Instead of paying $200 for a suit, I'll go to, uh, it's a resale shop on 79th Street. Uh, and I can find a suit, a nice looking suit for six to $10. Well, the difference between that six to $10 and the $200 I would spend, I can use that money you know, to help maintain uh, the uh, office, to, to put into the struggle and that sort of thing. And uh, rather than buy a, a Cadillac or a BMW or whatever they buy in these days, you know, I just buy a small car and utilize what the difference is in the struggle. No, I'm not a wealthy man, except I am rich uh, in experience and rich in my love for my people. Okay, what big disappointment have you uh, received in, from the African people? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I suppose one disappointment was my loss when I ran for Congress. And the reason I was disappointed is it, it kept me from carrying out what I wanted to do when I decided to run for Congress. I uh, had never, never, never given the thought to running for public office but I was persuaded to. And when I began looking at the congressional uh, experience, it occurred to me that I could build in the first congressional district a model congressional district. Here was a district then, and I guess it's even more black now, but then it was 92% black which means I didn't have to worry about white folks. I really didn't have to worry about them. Uh, <clears throat> and I looked at what Seabuck had done with no resources, with no money, no nothing. And I said to myself, now if we could do that with nothing, what could we do with the resources of Congress, with uh, uh, the stature of being a congressman? So I said, you know, we could build a model district for blacks that could fan out across the country. <coughs> That's why I decided to run, aside from the fact, I'll be honest, that it came at a time when Illinois Bell had kicked me off the radio, and I, had, I didn't have a job. And Congress is a good job. Gus Savage told me, he said, Lou, you cannot find a better job than Congress. And I discovered that he was right. Anyhow, uh, I was very disappointed that I lost, but I understood why I lost. See, Harold Washington defeated me. And uh, Harold defeated me because he wanted to maintain control, political control, of the first congressional district. Harold did not, because see, Harold and I were, we were in almost total agreement on issues. You know, Harold was a, Harold was a hell of a, a legislator, and he really brought through legislation <clears throat> for black and other oppressed people. So we had no problem. The problem was political. And Harold did not want to see an independent person be the congressman from this district. Because if I had become congressman of this district, politically, he and I would have been at odds. And Harold, Harold didn't want people around him who he could not control. And that's just a fact. So I was disappointed both in the fact that uh, that I did not win the congressional district. I was also disappointed uh, that Harold Washington uh, became the kind of mayor who really crushed 
the independent movement. And Harold crushed the independent movement. Uh, so I guess those would be the two major disappointments of my life. It's strange that, you know, he, you were one of the engineers behind uh, him running for mayor. And, and I, one thing that comes to mind when I think about that uh, congressional loss of yours is that you said that you, there was a machine <laughs> that was built and you had never seen that type of machine before. Yeah, when I lost that night, I told the press, uh, number one, I said, Charlie Hayes did not defeat me. Harold Washington, the new mayor, defeated me. And I also said that you have just witnessed the birth of a new and more ominous machine. And that was true. The, 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 the uh, tragedy was that our people could not see through what went down after Harold Washington became the mayor. They just couldn't see through it. They loved Harold so. They idolized Harold. They put Harold up on a, on a god-like pedestal. Uh, but Harold built his own machine. And Harold managed that machine like the excellent politician that he was. And Harold was a <laughs> he, Harold told me after he won, and a lot of people kept coming to me and say, Lou, you and Harold got to make up. We can't have the two of you at odds. Well, I was so, I was really bitter. I've lost the bitterness now. Time heals all wounds, they say. But uh, I told the people, I said, I don't want to, to make up with Harold. I said, if you get yourself kicked in the behind, why are you going to go and put yourself in a position to be kicked in the behind a second time? But they insisted that Harold and I talk. Uh, I finally agreed. I said, I will talk to Harold, but I take somebody with me. I'm not going by myself. I said, I need some witnesses to whatever goes down up there. So I took Danny Davis and, and Reverend John Porter. That was the most disastrous meeting. We met in Harold's apartment. And the, my first question to her, I said, Harold, why did you go to such lengths to defeat me? That man hit the ceiling. I've never seen that side of Harold Washington. Harold literally went crazy. Nasty. And he said to me, and I memorized the words, he said, you let me tell you something. You act like I, you act like I owe you something. But let me tell you, you owe me. And I looked at this man like he was out of his cotton pick in mind. He said, let me tell you something else. I just can't, I can't tell you the tone of voice he was using. He said, I, talking about himself now, I am a consummate politician. He said, you are a consummate communicator. How Washington told me with almost blood dripping out of his voice. He said, politics is a cold, hard, dirty game. He said, now, if you don't want to play cold, hard, dirty politics, you better get out of it. Well, I just stood up and I told John and, and uh, Dan, I said, look, I ain't going to stand there and take this crap. I said, I'm going. So they grabbed me. He said, no, I'll sit down. Let's see if we can. They tried to, nothing. They tried to, but it just didn't. So I finally, I just, I said, come on. I said, I'm going. Y'all can stay if you want to. So I left. Uh, 
This was, if you recall, the day Harold Washington announced he was going to run for mayor, November 10th, 1982. That's the same day that Illinois Bell called me to their offices and fired me from Lou's notebook. The saint. They fired me at 9 o'clock. Harold had his press conference at 11 o'clock to announce that he was going to run for mayor. And I said, well, why are you dropping my contract? They said, because you have become too partisan. I said, I couldn't be partisan. I said, I criticized the Democratic Party. I criticized the Republican Party. I criticized the Communist Party. So how are you going to call me partisan? I'm not leaning toward any party. So then they said, well, we're dropping your contract because, because of the work you're doing with Seabuck and your relationship with Harold Washington, which translated into I'd been pushing too hard on the radio for the election of Harold Washington. Well, <laughs> that was a disappointment because, as you know, by then, Lou's Notebook had become institutionalized in our community. But Harold, I don't know if I ever told this story publicly or not. Harold blocked me from getting back on the radio. I wanted to get, obviously I wanted to get back on the radio. I had a call one day from, uh, uh, at the bank, uh, Independence. You know, uh, Boutte. Al Boutte. And he said, Lou, come visit with me. That's his terminology. I went to see him. He said, we want to restore you to the airways. And I've got six black sponsors. I said, well, cool. I'd much rather have sponsorship of black people than the Illinois Bell. Uh, he said, all you have to do, these are his words, all you have to do is make your accommodations with Harold Washington. I said, what you mean? He said, well, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm a money man. You go talk to Harold. <laughs> well, I didn't want to talk to Harold because I'd had a disastrous meeting with him before. But... You know, I wanted to get back on the air, and I wanted to see what is this all about. I went to talk to Harold. Harold went to uh, Nutville. He said, Boutte told you that? I said, yeah. He said, Lou, I haven't seen Boutte for six months. Why would he tell you that? I said, Harold, you got to ask Boutte why he told me that. And he went to Nutville. So I could see I wasn't getting anywhere then, so I, I left then. I called Boutte. I said, Boutte, I don't know what y'all doing. But Harold said, you don't know nothing about that. Well, uh, that was the end of that. Wesley South called me after about a year and a half, maybe two years of being off the air. Wesley said, Lou, why don't you come on VON? exclusively. I'll put my staff to work, see how, what kind of commercials we can get. Uh, he said, if we could get four sponsors, I would uh, be able to pay you maybe a third of what you were getting with Illinois Bell. He said, but at least you'd be back on air. So I said, cool. He called me a couple of days and said, I've got three sponsors. I said, well, I can get you one. Because this is a dude who's been telling me through the years how he wanted to help me. And I'm going to give him his opportunity. I went to this dude and I s told him, I, you know, I just need one more sponsor. I can get back on the air. He said, well, I can't sponsor you now, but I know somebody who will. 
if you take a white sponsor? I said, it's according to who it is. And he said, it's uh, Wirtz of the Chicago Bulls. So I said, well, that's cool. I said, go ahead. He said, he owes me, so I, I can get him to sponsor you. <laughs> so the next day, I told him to call Wesley because Wesley handled the business. He called Wesley the next day and said, Wesley, you know, I, uh, I was trying to get this other sponsorship for Lou, and I, I, I uh, ran it past the mayor's office. And the mayor, he didn't say the mayor, he said the mayor's office told me to cool it. So Wesley said, what the hell are you doing calling the mayor's office? This ain't got nothing to do with the mayor. Well, I just thought I'd better. And in the next couple of days, the other three sponsors who had said they would sponsor me, they pulled out. So I got to drift. But I did go on the air. Just before I went on the air, Ed Gardner called and said he would be a sponsor. So I went on the air with one sponsor, which means I was earning maybe uh, one-tenth of what I was earning, but I was on the air. So Ed stayed with me for two cycles. Uh, then he dropped it. So uh, it's, it's really been a hassle trying to tell you another thing since I'm talking so much today. Well, this is what it's about. Uh, the day after, no, about 10 days after Harold won that election, people to uh, join IVI, Independent Voters of Illinois. And the letter said this organization did so much to help me get elected and it's such a great organization you should join right away about two weeks later here we got a, a, a citation of violations on this building that long and the citations were signed by Harold Washington Mayor and Jim Montgomery Corporation Council. Now, see, that's an old machine trick. You know that. They deal with you on violations on a building. And the reason why I knew that that was a crass political trick, this building is in the name of Georgia English. Not even in the name of Georgia English Palmer. It's in the name of Georgia English. But you know how that citation came? To Lou and Georgia Palmer. My name is nowhere near those papers. But it came to Lou and Georgia Palmer. So I knew then it was really an old machine trick to deal on political enemies through violations on their buildings. Man, well. Well, you know, I, I it just hurt. It really hurt. The idea to elect Chicago's first black mayor started right upstairs in this building. We did those political education classes every Saturday for a year and a half. A year and a half. We graduated more than 2,000 people. So when the time for Harold's uh, election came, we had 2,000 trained troops to put in the streets. And do you know? <coughs> After every four-week period, we would have a, uh, a graduation. Every graduation speaker was Harold Washington. He'd come by, make a nice little speak, give out the citations, 
you know, the first graduation we had, and this is when I knew that this community was ready. The first graduation we had was on the day of the coldest day in history, where the wind chill factor went down to 80 some below zero. We ain't having a heat. We are. We were so poor, still are. We had no heat in the building. Do you know? Those brothers and sisters sat upstairs with their coats and scarves and and uh, gloves on. You could see the breath coming out of their mouths, and nobody left. Harold Washington was the speaker. He stayed the whole time. And I told George, I said, George, these brothers and sisters are ready, because you know how much we we are, how bad we are about about cold weather. Well. I don't even know where, where, where I got started on this, but anyhow, the, uh, the reality. And you see, that's why it hurts so much to watch our people give this city back to white folks. Bad enough to give it to white folks, but to give it back to a daily. You know, after we had, we had built Chicago to a peak of black solidarity. I mean, man, it had gotten, yeah, I have to tell you, but by the time it was time to elect Harold, you better not even think about not voting for Harold. I mean, it better not even come in your mind. Somebody go upside your head. I mean, you know the religious fervor that came about in that period when we were, uh, were campaigning for Harold Washington. And then for us to just give the city back to white folks, I wouldn't even call that a disappointment. A disappointment is not, a, is not strong enough a word. It was, I'm really depressed now. I am actually depressed because everything we fought for from 1900 started in 81, from 1981 to 1989 has been wiped away, destroyed, stepped on, stomped on. And I don't see any possibility of taking this city back in this century. So that was just devastating. When you mentioned somebody in, in uh, passing there, Mr. Ed Gardner, what are your thoughts on Mr. Ed Gardner? Well, Ed's, Ed's a great guy. Ed is the leading African-American businessman willing to turn much of his money back into the community. Uh, without Ed in our original struggle to elect Harold, I don't know if we could have won. You know, Ed put the resources behind us in that voter registration drive. And uh, he, he, is, he is a man unto himself. He and his wife, I should say, a couple unto themselves because there's only one Ed Gardner. And uh, I have great admiration for him. About Tom Todd. Tom is <laughs> my man. Tom. Tom is, 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 is an extraordinary thinker and articulator. And I have never asked Tom to speak for us, and he frequently speaks for us, that he has not agreed to do so. And during our Dump Daily campaigns, you know, Tom was the point man. And uh, Tom has suffered because of that. Tom, I don't want to speak out of school, but you know, Tom's law business has suffered because of his uh, straightforward presentation of our struggle. And uh, 
Uh, Tom, on a scale of 1 to 10, Tom's got to be 12, 13, 14, or 15 in my book. Tremendous brother. Okay, how did the uh, Lose Notebook come about? And, uh, you know, when did it start? Back in 1970. That was a period when the civil rights struggle was beginning to wane. But Illinois Bell was having a lot of trouble in the ghettos of this country. Their, their trucks were being run out of the community, their cables were being cut, and it was, they were catching hell. So they wanted to find some kind of way to uh, head off that kind of activity in Chicago. It, it, it had not hit Chicago. Uh, they called Vince Cullors Advertising Agency and asked Vince to work out some kind of plan so that they could develop some rapport with the black community. Vince thought of the idea of a commentary. Called me, asking would I be interested, and I said yes. I was working for the Daily News then. And uh, put it together in 1970. And although Bell tried to drop the contract at least two times, the, the community just raised so much noise, they kept it going. So I was on the air for 12 years before uh, they finally dropped me, and I later learned that the apparently the real culprit in dropping me was Jane Byrne. Uh, there was some kind of a, an arrangement with the uh, telephone company and the city. And it was a $30 million deal. I don't know the detail. But somebody inside the company told me that Jane Byrne had told the company that if you keep Lou Palmer on the air, we, this deal not going to go through. So... I had her on my show one night, and I asked her about it on the air. Oh, that wasn't me. That was six black aldermen. I said, well, what's six black aldermen? Oh, I couldn't give their names. <laughs> so <laughs> there's something to the story for sure. Okay, you spoke of the Daily News. What was it like? Was that, you know, working at the Daily News? Oh, I began my career with the white press with Chicago American. Uh, I had a very good friend who... See, I, I had kept quitting the Defender. And there really wasn't another newspaper. I worked for the Chicago Courier for a little while, but that was a very marginal operation. We never knew whether we'd be paid or not, and if we got paid... There were many places that wouldn't cash our checks. I and mean, it just wasn't a, <laughs> a sound situation. This friend talked me into going to Chicago American. He had some contacts down there. So that was the afternoon paper then owned by the Tribune. Well, that's a whole volume within itself, and I'll just indicated by saying that the racism was so rife. It was just so thick you could cut it. I managed to stay with them for, I think, about two and a half years. But it was, I used to call George. I wasn't married to them, but we were very close, and I would call George. I said, George, I can't take this. And she would say, well, I'll go get a cup of coffee and kind of cool off and see what happens. And I would go through so much stuff. Then one day I got a call from the editor of the Daily News, the competitor to the American, asking me would I consider making a switch. Because I just have to admit that my work was superb. I was a good journalist. I stayed, my byline stayed on the front page. 
In fact, some of those white boys used to say to me, Lou, you just turn in too much work. Can't you kind of slow down because you make us look bad? And I just looked at them and laughed. Uh, but my, my byline was on the front page very frequently. The Daily News edited, kept watching my byline, so he invited me to come over and talk to him. When I walked in, he was shocked. He had no idea I was black. So <clears throat> I said to him, I said, you, I could see the expression on his face. I said, you apparently didn't know I was a black man. He said, well, I have to admit I didn't. He said, but that has nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, he said, it's good because we've been looking for a black reporter who could write a once a week column for us. Well, he didn't have to say anymore, you know, writing a column was the, that's the essence of, of journalism. So we worked out a deal and uh, I went to the Daily News. It was just as racist as the other paper. And as a columnist, I ran into just extraordinary uh, racism. All columns at a newspaper, well, certainly at this, it's the general practice, that columns are handled by an editor who's called editor of the editorial page. Well, everybody else's column went to the editor of the editorial page. My column went direct to the editor. Now, he's the boss. The editor. And uh, at least every other time, maybe more, he would call me in and say, I don't know if you ought to say this this way, or I don't know if you ought to deal with this subject, and you know, all that old stuff. I, on the first few occasions, I would make some adjustments and rewrite or something. But after maybe, I don't know, but after a few of those instances, I just said, now wait a minute. I said, when you hired me, you said you wanted a column written from the black experience. I said, but here you are, a white man living in Glencoe telling me what the black experience is. I said, I just can't rewrite this. Well, over a period of time, I would write a column, and they wouldn't run it. Just once a week, they wouldn't run it. So things just kept, just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I remember one particular instance. This was not about a column. This was about a news story. Uh, it had to do, a cop was killed behind that old hotel. 67th and Stony. Southmore. Southmore. That was Stone Country. In fact, Stone Headquarters is right behind it. Uh, I got a call from the paper one night saying that there had been a police shooting behind the Southmore Hotel and asked me to go out there and check it out. There indeed had been a policeman shot and killed. And the policemen were just going crazy out there, knocking down doors and searching people. Oh, they were just raised in hell. Well, uh, Charles Edward Bay, who was the number two man in the Stones, was accused of doing the shooting. They had a press conference, the Stones, and during that press conference, I read between the lines that Bay was willing to turn himself in, but he was afraid that police would kill him. So after the press conference, I went to uh, whoever was presiding over the press conference. I said, uh, would Bay be willing to turn himself in to me if he was assured of absolute protection from the police? 
And the guy said yes. So we worked out the details. I told my editor the whole picture. And I said, I'm supposed to get a phone call tonight of where to pick up B. I said, uh, we'll bring him to the Daily News. Because I know ain't no policeman gonna rush the Daily News and shoot Bay in the Daily News. Well, it was about midnight. We were supposed to have heard from Bay about seven or eight, but it, you know, it didn't. We just waited, 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 waited. The call came about midnight. And I had taken, I don't, a lot of things I don't do by myself. I took uh, Lakey Ashford, who then was head of the Urban League, and uh, who was uh, another person. And uh, they stayed with me. Uh, finally, the call came. Told me where to go pick up Bay. So I called the office, and I said, we're on our way. We picked up Bay, had him lie down in the, the uh, on the floor of the back seat, you know, so the cops couldn't see him, and took him to the Daily News. When I got to the Daily News, the, my editor was there. He lives in Glencoe. I was kind of surprised, but you know, okay. And he had called Judge Epton, the brother of uh, Epton that ran for mayor, Saul Epton. And Epton was there. And the plan was for Bay to surrender to Epton and then be taken to county jail. So I say, well, first thing I want to do, I want we want to uh, strip Bay naked, and I want a photographer to shoot his picture. I say, now, Judge, if tomorrow he got bruises all over him, we know he's been beaten. So they went through that. And they were ready to take him to county jail. So I said, uh, uh, I think I'm going to ride over there with him. By now, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning. So I rode over there with him, saw to it that he was, you know, not messed with. So I came back to write my story. Hell of a story, man. So when I walked in the, in the newsroom, Roy Fisher, the editor, said, Lou, read this. And I said, what? He said, That's, this is the story. I said, what story? He said, the story on, on the surrender of Bay." So I took this thing and I read it, said, uh, Charles Edward Bay, number two man, and the Black Peace Stone Rangers uh, surrendered last night to the Chicago Daily News. I said, this is not right. What do you mean it's not right? I said, he did not surrender to the Chicago Daily News. He surrendered to three black men who brought him to the Chicago Daily News. Oh, no, this is right. I said, it is not right. He said, you know what that hunky told me? He said, it's right because I said it's right. Man, I hit the ceiling. I hit the natural ceiling. <laughs> I got, I went to the phone and called Jeff Ford. I said, Jeff, they down here messing with Bay. I put it that way. <laughs> I said, you bring some folks down here, because we got to straighten this mess out. Man, in about 10 or 15 minutes, here was Jeff and all these black pea stones. And <laughs> so you, Jeff doesn't walk. And then he didn't walk. He sauntered. He would just, he just, just sauntered over. I said, Jeff, will you tell this man, pointing to my editor, that this story can't run? 
I said, in the first place, I didn't write it. And it's got my byline on it. Jeff, uh, I've forgotten exactly what he said, but he said something like, you know, it, it wouldn't be healthy for you to, you, you know, he was very soft-spoken, uh, for you to let this get into the paper like this, and not let Mr. Palmer write his story. So <laughs> Roy Fisher said, here, you go ahead and write the story, just like a little child. Well, that was one of the few victories I had at the Daily News. I just can't begin to tell you all the stuff that went down. But when I finally quit over a racist act, I sent in my letter of resignation, gave him two weeks, and the next day, the editor called me in and said, uh, you don't have to wait two weeks. He said, I've got your check for you. You can leave now. I had a lot of material in filing cases. I, I've been there almost four years, and I collected a lot of material. And uh, I wanted my material, and I was worried they may not let me take my material, because if I left it, they just burn it up. I use that, that kind of material I use today. I go in that file and find stuff that's very useful to me. So I got me some, some cartons and start packing. Six file drawers. I said, I'm going to get this out of here. So I called Bobby Rush. Fred had been killed by then. Bobby was in charge of the Panthers. I said, Bobby, send me six Black Panthers. I said, tell them to dress up in full regalia. <laughs> Bobby said, OK. <laughs> Man, those six Black Panthers came up to the Daily News City room. And I threw up my hand so they could see me. It's a huge room. And I beckoned them over. I said, would each one of you guys take one of these cartons, take it downstairs to my car. Each one picked up one. And I led them out of the, uh, the Chicago Daily News sitting room. And nobody opened their mouth. Not a word. And I consider that a major victory. One of the few victories that Lou Palmer had at the Daily News. In short, my experience with the white press was devastating. And when I quit the Daily News, I called a press conference and explained why I had quit. And I said that no white person will ever again in my lifetime edit anything that I write. That was in 1970. Three, I think 72 or something like that. And to this day, no white person has ever edited anything that I have written, which means I don't write for white papers or magazines or anything anymore. I also said at that press conference, there are only certain blacks who will edit what I write. And they will be black people who think like I think, who understand what my ideology is. And to this day, no Negro has edited anything that I write. Well, some people think that's crazy, but it's not. You see, communication is key to our struggle. And, what, and the messages <clears throat> and images and symbols that those of us who are communicators, the messages and images and symbols that we uh, transmit go into people's minds and help determine the way they think. So, you know, whenever I talk to uh, aspiring young 
black journalists, I make it clear to them that they are moving into an arena of extraordinary power because they deal with the minds of people. Uh, I had a young lady in here just the other day who was so upset because her professor had told her that she couldn't write. This was, she's at uh, Roosevelt University. And I said, you got any samples of your writing? And she brought me some samples. I said, you got a lot of potential. I said, was this a white professor or a black professor? She said, it's a white professor. I said, okay. Lou Palmer Black is telling you, you've got potential. Don't you let anybody turn you around. She was ready to change schools, change her major, because she was so upset. I said, you go back there, and I sent her to uh, one of the brothers who teaches down there. I called him, and she, he said she'd be, he'd be glad to counsel her. I said, don't let these people turn you around. We need black communicators. And the woman, the young woman, talked like her head was really screwed on right. Anyhow, uh, so when I quit the Defender, I mean quit the Daily News, I started the Black Express with nothing. We started with $3,000. It lasted 14 months, but we just couldn't get the advertising because I made a major mistake, major economic mistake. I wouldn't take advertising from white folks. So that was, a <laughs> that was a mark of death. And we just couldn't get enough advertising to sustain it. But for 14 uh, months, we produced it. In the first issue, I had a headline, here is the column the Daily News would not run. And I published one of those columns, they just would not run. And uh, that was just a beautiful experience, but takes a lot of money. And when I, when I uh, had to fold it, I was $65,000 in the hole. And it had gotten to the point that the printer, you know, I had to pay him in advance for him to print the paper, which I just couldn't do. But it was a great experience. Well, where are those uh, papers at? Do you have any of those papers in any museum, library, anywhere around here? Oh, I got a bunch of them in my, in my basement. Oh, yeah. I noticed that uh, you made a trip to the homeland. I was with you, and I want to know what was your uh, impression of your return to the homeland. Uh, just get your thoughts on it. Well, it was my first trip. Margaret Burroughs uh, sponsored it. She called up one night on, 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 on the air when I was hosting on Target and said, Lou, I'm going to take you to Africa. I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, what you talking about, Margaret? We're going to Africa in uh, July, and I'm going to take you with me. I said, well, <laughs> I ain't got no money to go to Africa. She began a uh, drive raise enough money for me and Georgia to go. Georgia wouldn't go because Georgia won't fly. So uh, we had a 10-day tour of the Gambia and Senegal. It was just a, an unbelievable experience. I'd never been to Africa. I really kind of resigned myself to thinking that I would never go. But it was, it was a beautiful tour because it showed two different segments of the African experience. The Gambia, very poor country, uh, agricultural, primitive, really, uh, but where the people are just indescribably friendly, warm, and they look just like you and me. Uh, you think you're on 47th Street. It was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. Senegal, which is about an hour away by air, is just the opposite. The Gambia had been colonized by the English, so English was the, the language there. 
uh, Senegal was colonized by the French, and they they are a haughty, uh, stuck up kind of people, uh, and I'm glad that we spent more time in in the Gambia than we did in Senegal because Senegal is very modern, very. It's just beautiful and modern, uh, but the people were not the same as the people in the Gambia. Uh, but we went to uh, a slave compound, Gory Island, and it was just so moving to know that you're standing on, on the grounds where our forebears were, were brought and sold into slavery. You saw the various aspects of, they had a fattening room because the slaves weren't fat enough. They had to feed them to the point that they reached a certain weight. They had a weigh-in room. It was just a, an unforgettable experience. People ask me, am I going back? I, I'd like to very much. I don't know if I will. But you see, it's so much of Africa. You know, I just saw two countries. Uh, but I'd love to go back. And I think it's something that every one of our people ought to do at least once. Just go back and, and get the feeling of being at home. As we get ready to wrap this up, I really uh, appreciate it. And I, you know, would like to get a couple more thoughts from you. Now, you're from Virginia. Uh, Virginia is one of those original colonies. Did you, as an African growing up in Virginia, feel any way special as part of the Jefferson and the rest of those uh, <laughs> uh, Europeans uh, from a... Uh... Not at all. No way. In fact, it didn't even come into our thinking. The answer flatly, no. But I couldn't let that go by without. Listen, Ada, uh, I asked you about some persons uh, before. I asked you about um, Tom Todd and a couple of What are your thoughts on Reverend Jackson? Well, you know, I used to be a, a severe critic of Jackson. Uh, but about 1980, I think, uh, we sat down and talked. Uh, and Jesse said, Lou, let's just look at this situation. He said, I'll bet you that three-fourths of the time, you and I are together in, on these issues. He said, that's batting 750. He said, that's a hell of a batting average. He said, no reason for us. And Jesse was never critical of me. I was always critical of Jesse. So he said, you know, we just ought to sit down, and if you got a problem, come to me, and let's sit and talk it out. So we, we, we made up, and uh, I went to push and announced that from henceforth, the Reverend Jackson and I are going to be working totally together. If there are some problems, we'll sit down and we'll try to work them out. So we just joined hands, and ever since then, we've been working very closely together. Uh, a lot of things, and Jesse knows it, and we talk about it, that I just don't agree with. I don't agree with the Rainbow Coalition, you see. I understand why he is developing a Rainbow Coalition. That's the only way he'll ever win uh, uh, an office like the presidency. Roland Burris here uh, getting ready to run for governor, the only way that he can win is to play coalition politics. Oh, I understand why some of our politicians feel the need for coalition politics. You cannot win a uh, like governor without white votes, Hispanic votes, Asian votes. You certainly can't win the presidency. So while I don't ideologically agree with the rainbow and coalition politics. I understand, you know, uh, 
insofar as Jesse is concerned, I am convinced that Jesse is a totally sincere person when it comes to the struggle. A lot of people say he's all for himself and all like that. I don't believe that. I've been too close to the man, and I've seen him in action, and I know what he's... Hey, so uh, I have great confidence in Jesse, and I think he has done a lot of good, and I think he's going to continue to do a lot of good. Uh, I just happen to have, in some instances, a different ideological perspective than he has. Uh, I don't know why he'd want to be president of this United States, but he wants to be. And uh, I will work to try to get him there. I doubt that he'll ever get there, but I'll certainly work to get him there. I think Jesse, without a doubt, is the key leader among our people. I do not believe that he should be considered as the only leader. I believe in layers of leadership. But, uh, and you got to give the man credit. He's brilliant. He is uh, energetic. I don't know how he does the many things that he does. If you look at that man's travel schedule, you just wouldn't believe it, you know? Uh, so I'm, I'm a total fan of Jesse. When, when now when things, uh, he does things that I disagree with, I just call him and tell him. You know, I didn't, I, on that punch 40 mess, I just thought, Jesse, you way off base now. Uh, he gives me his rationale. I understand his rationale. I just don't agree with it. Because when you're a politician, you got to <laughs> be a politician. You're here in Chicago, and we just went through this uh, division between this Tim Evans forces and the Eugene Sawyer forces. What is it going to take to bridge the gap between the two groups? That's the biggest concern that I have right now. Uh, I don't know what it's going to take to bring our people back together to the point that we were. Uh, I am convinced that, that Tim Evans made the biggest mistake. We had a black mayor, Gene Sawyer. Tim and his forces brought about the 89 election uh, and worked to keep Sawyer from being elected. Uh, I, I don't know how, I, I guess about the only way that we're going to get back to some semblance of solidarity is I think Tim is going to have to make some, uh, I don't know what the word is, but he's going to have to let our people know where he really stands. Uh, I'm concerned about the Harold Washington party. I think the Harold Washington party has a lot of potential. But Tim has never, since April 4th, indicated what his plans are for the Harold Washington party. He founded it, you know. Somebody called me the other day asking, why don't I take over the Harold Washington party? I said, that's ridiculous. That's Tim Evans' party. Uh, I certainly would not be, if I wanted to, I wouldn't want to, but I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to try to take over uh, a party founded by somebody else. Uh, but I have said on many occasions that Tim and Dorothy Tillman and Bobby Rush and uh, any of the other Democratic ward committeemen tied to Tim Evans, and this includes Tim, that they in no way, they can in no way push the Harold Washington party as long as they remain Democratic ward commitment. You know, if they are serious and sincere, they will resign their commitment ships and begin the process of making the Harold Washington Party a vital entity. So I don't know. I I'm very disturbed about our immediate future because I do not see a leadership uh, emerging that could make the Harold Washington Party a real independent political party. So I don't know. I just don't know what's going to happen. And Judge Pincham, I forgot to ask you about him. Judge Pincham is, is an extraordinary man, uh, a rare uh, member of the judiciary 
who will speak his, his piece. He speaks his piece, and he lays it out. Uh, I would like to see him as the first black Illinois Supreme Court justice. Uh, whether his politics will get in the way of that, I don't know. But he jeopardizes his own position by speaking out in the interests of, of his people. So I rate him very high. I want to thank you very much, Brother Lou, for uh, granting me this opportunity. There's a lot more, and you never know. I may be back with another tape. I'm running out of tape, and that's why I'm in this part. And I want to thank you very much for uh, allowing me this opportunity to put you on record. Right on. <laughs>